Okay. Go ahead. Okay, you're ready? All right. Welcome, everyone, to um, a spring webinar in Maryland Online's um, professional development series. We offer a, a handful of webinars throughout the year, uh, fall, spring, and summer. And I'm Julie Porosky Hamlin, director of Maryland Online. And I'd like to uh, um, also introduce Wendy Gilbert, the executive director, the one who's, who's been also speaking just now. And without further ado, uh, let me introduce our presenter, David Buck, a professor of English at Howard Community College. Before joining um, Howard's faculty in 2007, he was an English instructor for eight years at Rowan College at Burlington County in New Jersey. I hope I pronounced Rowan correctly, David. Uh, David is a facilitator of Howard Open, which is the college's open educational resources initiative um, that supports faculty who wish to adopt and implement OER in their courses in place of um, costly commercial textbooks. Uh, David's professional interests include writing assessment, feedback practices, ungrading, mastery-based learning, and open pedagogy. He holds a master's degree in education from Temple University in Philadelphia. David, I want to go on to say, is one of Maryland Online's star presenters. You can tell from that list of his interests that I mentioned that um, not only uh, do we have we found him, and I think all of you will find him to be an engaging presenter, but he also has wide-ranging interest and expertise in several of the um, topics that are sort of top of mind for several of us right now. And in that light, um, I, I just want to say quickly that I think it's really interesting that we are focusing today, uh, the, the topic of this webinar is student motivation because it is so basic, so essential that I think sometimes it gets, it's, gets lost when we uh, spend our time talking about some of the newer glitzier things, but we can't forget it. So I'm, I believe that we're very pleased to be having this um, the, uh, student motivation spotlighted in one of our webinars. So David, please take it away. Okay, thank you. Let's share my screen with you. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see that. So thank you, Julie, and thank you, Wendy, for I always love um, presenting for Maryland Online. You guys are good people, and uh, it's always good to surround yourself with good people. Um, I'm going to make this presentation um, Creative Commons licensed, so it's free to you to um, when Julie or Wendy gives you the link to this. Um, you can remix it, revise it, retain it, reuse, uh, readapt, whatever you want to do with it is, is fine with me. I'm actually going to start with um, kind of um, disagreeing with Julie about the expertise part. <laughs> I always put a disclaimer in my presentations that uh, I'm just a guy. Uh, I'm just a teacher that has a high tolerance for failure, um, for trying things bombing, learning from it, and then trying it again. Um, I'm going to talk about motivation, but I'm sure uh, a bunch of you here are way more um, experts at motivation. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I'm just presenting today from my own perspective and my experiences with students. Um, I have been teaching for about 21 years. Um, so Do you want to spin on this with me, Roseanne? I'm sorry? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I thought I heard someone, sorry. Um, and so uh, I'm ju I just gleaned from all of that experience from um, uh, about student motivation. So that's what I'm trying to, to give you today, okay? Now there are only, I think, 18 people here. So if you want to interrupt me and ask a question, that's great. If Julie or Wendy would like to look at the chat and then we can end 
a little early and then do q and I'd, I'd love to be in a dialogue with everyone rather than just speaking at you. So hopefully uh, you'll feel that I'm speaking with you today. Okay, so most of the time we think of motivation as something that is confrontational. Um, fear, a deadline, uh, a directive from our boss, right? Instead of an invitation. And it's very interesting that we build our structures of education, our courses, our programs around this idea of exam time, uh, assignment due dates, deadlines, uh, penalties if you don't turn something in. And there's a sense that this fear does motivate us. The problem I have with fear is that, is it sustainable? And do we become numb to that approaching deadline after it's bludgeoned us for so long? Right. And so the idea of motivation here is something that is counterproductive to fear. And I'm going to be talking about that. And the two things that I think are counterproductive to fear are compassion and trust. And I'll be going through that as we as we move through um, motivation, as Julie said, is an essential critical piece to learning. And it is we we. Um, we basically set ourselves up for failure if we don't approach motivation with our students. If we assume that our content, our, the way our courses are structured, uh, the way we have online bells and whistles, and they're gonna be enough to keep the students uh, motivated. I think we need to <clears throat> disabuse ourselves of those, of those notions, but it's a critical piece to target for learning. The problem here is that there's no real single theory that explains human motivation. Uh, we are complex beings and our students are even particularly more complex with complex needs and desires. And I wanna stop here and say, especially when we're in the midst of a global pandemic. So when our students are coming through our courses, they are dealing with very present trauma, very present oppression, uh, stress, anxiety, the news, political unrest, social unrest. And we can't deny those things and think that our students are gonna be able to compartmentalize them and then go through our course. We can't even do that. And I know I've been talking to some of my colleagues that we have been under an, Im an immense amount of stress that messes with our cognitive function. And so motivation for learning while a global pandemic is occurring you, you get the challenge there. So the question I'm having for this, uh, this presentation is simple. How do we engage our students' locus of motivation? And it's a complex issue. Um, students learn in different times and formats for different purposes with different professors at different levels. And especially at the community college level, if you are from a community college uh, today listening, um, we, you, we know this, we have multiple diverse levels of students in our courses. So how do we tap into that motivation that fits inclusively for everyone in our classroom? And so I'm gonna break it down to more manageable factors. And I'm gonna try to do this in the talk here, which is the complex interaction between the teacher, the student and the curriculum or the content. Um, if we can, understand those relationships, maximize those relationships. Uh, we can yield higher engagement, hopefully, in our courses. And engagement, motivation, inspiration, right? They're all kind of synonyms. We use them interchangeably. So let's do that, right? Let's not be um, too particular about the semantics of this, but we're talking about engaging students, uh, uh, you know, tapping into that, that motivation. So the key factors here uh, are professor, student, and content and learning setting. I put the student right in the middle, right? And that is a major philosophy of my teaching, which is student-centered. Place the student in the middle of the assessment, in the middle of the content, in the middle of the activities, instead of being the person who fills up the empty vessels that are passive, right? Um, I don't take that stand at all, and I try not to, but it is a dynamic power play that some students have been traumatized by, where the professor is the oracle, the seat of authority, of judgment, of evaluation. Uh, for me, someone who 
you know, I, I have that imposter syndrome where I think I'm going to, they're going to find out that I'm a fraud and, and take me away and, and take away my job. Uh, it's very easy for me to say, I'm a co-learner with my students. I'm okay with ambiguity, with nuance. Yeah, I can guide them and I can encourage them and support them, but we are learners in a community of practice. And that's, that's the goal there. So let's do the student first, right? So we're focusing on the, the, the student and we're talking about setting up conditions that allow the student to climb the ladder themselves, okay? And that is really what, you know, a lot of our content is about something and maybe we want, we want them to do something. Maybe we should focus on them becoming something, the student becoming their fullest version of their humanity. And, and I think that's where the, the focus of motivation is gonna be for this, for this talk. And we know this, right? Uh, students are motivated by, by intrinsic things and extrinsic things. Now, the intrinsic things are what we're going for, that curiosity, that independence, that self-efficacy, self-efficacy, I can do this. I, I'm confident in my learning. The extrinsic motivators are important. They're there, they work. My problem with them is that they are externally uh, existent outside the student. So therefore, there's no ownership over those extrinsics. Uh, the student doesn't identify with extrinsic motivators, although they are, their self-perception is guided by them. Focus on grades. I'm a B student or oh, I'm, I'm a C student. I'm, that's, that's who I am. Students have conflated their grades and GPAs as a signal of what they are and their value and worth as a person. That's crazy to me, and that's wrong, and it's almost unethical. I have a moral obligation to incite my students to learn on their own and see value in what they are, whether they're, whether they're in my class or outside of my class. And so the point of motivation is we know that these exist, how can we leverage them for the best good of the student? And we can't mention motivation without talking about Daniel Pink, right? So Daniel Pink, you know, he talks about this idea that, that people aren't uh, motiva motivated by monetary rewards, although I must be an outlier because if I get paid, I'm good. <laughs> I'll work for the money. If you pay me a good salary, I will work my butt off for you. But anyway, I, I get that that's not sustainable. But he, he focuses on this idea of when I have autonomy, I control what I do. This is what we call student agency, right? Uh, giving them the power to make choices about their learning. Mastery, can I do it or is it too beyond me? And then this is where we get into this wacky idea of academic rigor, which is a horrible word. Rigor is rigor mortis. The, the body is dead on the table. It's stiff. It's not moving. Um, but we have to have this idea that if they come into my college classroom, they got to know that they're in a college class and I'm going to teach them that you're not in high school anymore. And this idea of making it above, and we hear these horrible stories of professors saying, there will be only five A's in this class. There will be only B, uh, even before the class began, right? And this idea of if you don't allow students to master the work, they won't be motivated to do it. Finally, Pink says purpose. I have to have a purpose. I have to have this idea that I'm part of a community of a greater thing than myself. Right, And in my class, in a composition class, this is what I call our community of practice. We are writers. So we are all writers. We're going to identify as writers. One of my first blog assignments is, who are you as a writer? And I ask my students, what were their previous experiences with writing? What do you think? Are you good at writing? Or are you a good writer? Which, what, is there a difference for you? And we talk about these things in dialogue. So if we think about motivation, we're trying to get these three things going at the same time. What we find here is that motivation is a very personal thing and it's powerful for students, okay? And if we don't have, as a student, if I don't have a personal connection, an authentic reason for doing something, it's gonna be very difficult for me to do it. Even if it has a grade on it or percentage or all of that or if my professor's you know, threatening me that I have to, it's gonna be very, very difficult to be engaged. So we find that our students are disengaged um, when they don't have that authentic interpersonal connection with what they're doing. 
students have certain perceptions of themselves that, uh, that affect their motivation level. Uh, I talked about this before, but self-efficacy means I have confidence in my cognitive abilities. When students have self-efficacy, they're self-regulated learners and they're able to employ different learning strategies. How do we get students to have self-efficacy? That's a great question. I think I have some answers for that. I'll talk about later, but that's an important part of the way our students perceive themselves. And when students are goal oriented, and that's that goal, that motivation factory that's within us, we're good as human beings going after goals, but those goals have to be manageable, process oriented. I have to be able to see things. This is what we call maybe uh, you've heard this term scaffolding, where I get up the steps and I see the value of my labor. Um, when students have goals, they are more engaged cognitively. Now, let me make a difference here, a, a, a separation here. I'm not conflating goals with course objectives. I have a problem with course objectives. They sit in our syllabus and usually they're preceded by the statement at the end of the course, students will be able to. Is, that's not a pedagogically arrogant statement. I don't know what is as if I can assume all of my students will be able to do these objectives at the end of 14, 15 weeks. Either I assume I'm a Superman or my students are, don't have the challenges that they have. It's basically yeah. ignorant. So what I try to do is make it a metacognitive thing. What are your learning goals for my class? We wanna do this, this thing. We wanna create ourselves as writers. That's the goal of the class, I get it. The, the class has to have a goal. But I'm not going to assume that my objectives or maybe the institution's objectives, because I didn't write the objectives for my course that I'm doing. But if my institution's objectives, I'm not going to assume that they're yours. So let's find a way that we can tap into why, your why, of being in this class. And let's see if we can dialogue. to And that sense of dialogue allows them to feel that they are humans, right? And that they have a piece of the action in my class rather than being dictated to. What we find in our studies of motivation is that if there's a clear sense of purpose for the student, that is when they have engagement, but also stamina and determination. I use that word determination there, but you've heard this maybe in, in some recent uh, discussions of educational practice, that grit, resilience, growth mindset. It's all good, it's all semantics, but I like that idea of sticking to it, right? So I have this goal, but I'm gonna have stamina and determination. Now I teach through labor, I'm, I'm a labor-based uh, uh, approach in my composition, which means I'm going to value your labor. The labor that you do in my class is actually you. I'm going to value you, your thinking, your planning, your ruminating, your becoming. I'm going to actually uh, value that in the class. When I'm able to do that as a student, I might have more stamina to fin finish out the labor. And we coming off of spring break, many of us, that's where that stamina is so important, where we might lose our sense of motivation. And we have to remind ourselves of that determined mindset that we have that only comes through purpose. There has to be a purpose. If it's just to get the grade, get the, the GPA level, get the credits, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. We're not going to find deep learning. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Very interesting that students develop their self theories based on the way they are approached with challenging situations. So when you think about giving your students all the uh, ammunition to deal with a challenging situation, that's at the core of their self theory and at the core of their motivation, which is really, really interesting when we, when we think about that. In my um, estimation, there are three types of learners that come into my classroom. The surface learner, the strategic learner, and the deep learner. If you notice, I put the deep learner right in the middle there. That's what I'm trying to develop in my class, a deep learner. So what are these? Well, the surface learner feels fears failure. They just want to survive. They're the ones that ask, is this going to be on the exam, right? The strategic learner wants the high grades, but they are able to figure out what the professor wants. They're good at memorizing and regurgitating, spitting back on an exam. The deep learner 
is the learner that wants to understand and apply what they're learning to new, novel, authentic situations. This deep learner is able to adapt through motivation any new uh, challenge with new approaches. So they're able to take what we give them and discuss and apply it to new situations. That's the learner I'm trying to motivate in my class. The surface and strategic, I actually try to take away that fear for them by entering into a dialogue that talks about their why, their sense of purpose, their reason for, or their learning targets for my class. Uh, Ken Bain is, is the one that's, uh, that has come out with these types of learners. And he says this great statement. I love this statement. And this is, please look at the top of here. We're talking about natural critical learning environments. The assumption is what we normally do in traditional settings is not natural. Rows, uh, passive students listening to a lecture, right? We don't want to do those natural, uh, unnatural learning environments. So what are natural critical learning environments? They're when human beings are trying to solve problems or answer questions that they have come to regard as important, intriguing, or beautiful. I love that. Now I am in the humanities, I get it. In English, it's all unicorns and rainbows. We can talk about our feelings and all that, I get that. But when, when a student is trying to solve an issue that they regard as beautiful, that man is beyond me, it's beyond the content, it's in the mystical area of a student's cognitive development. And it's a beautiful thing. So what we want to do is try to create motivational learning centers and environments that are natural. And the natural learner does not learn through uh, passive you know, uh, uh, accumulation of content. They're out about getting, trying, failing, getting feedback, trying again. So now we talk about the professor. So we have the student, now the professor. Um, and I talk, talked about this power dynamic a little bit earlier. We have a sacred duty as professors to treat our students as human beings, not as numbers or names on a grade book. And the power there of that, that uh, uh, responsibility is huge for me. I think we have an ethical moral obligation to incite the motivation of our students so that they become deep learners. So I love Sir Ken Robinson, if you haven't seen him on YouTube, check out his TED Talks. Uh, he has passed on, I believe, last year. But he, I love his metaphor of the farmer. And he basically says, in agriculture, you don't make plants grow. We don't make our students learn. Instead, you create conditions for growth. Plants grow themselves. So the question for us is, are we creating in our staff and faculty the conditions for our students to become their, their best selves, to grow into whatever they're wanting to grow into. And I love the plants grow themselves. Hear the action in that. That is not passive at all. There's no passivity. It's all action and engagement, right? But we have to set those conditions to hopefully produce those ends. And at the end of the day, the professor, in my opinion, is obligated to create healthy relationships that have trust at their core. And when we have that type of impact, we're impacting non-cognitive skills, okay? We're impacting skills like motivation, adaptability, self-restraint, the idea of self-regulation. And interesting is that those non, you know, some people call them soft skills, right? Whatever. But they're nice. They're good skills to have other than just the cognitive, the intellectual, the critical. They're 10 times more predictive of our students' long-term success. Test scores, uh, students are more than test scores. We know this, especially if you, when you talk about the test, if it's valid, if it's fair, if it's diverse enough. I mean, you know, you think about the social injustice of standardized tests. Um, but when we can actually get this type of result by focusing on our students' motivation, boy, that's a, that's a great thing to go after. I always cite this when I talk about motivation. There is a um, Memorial University, it's, a, it's a, a university in Canada. And they did a study of their students and they asked, what are the um, characteristics of the best professor? 
And I think about over a thousand students participated in this. And they came up with nine. I don't know why they came up with nine and not 10, top 10. But anyway, these are the nine things that the students wanted in their professors. Guess what's number one? Respect. Not, you know, being organized, not being, you know, responsive, communicative. It's respect. And I want to give you the students' words on the top five. These are not my definitions. These are the definitions from those students in that study. And look at the number one thing they wanted from their professors. An understanding, and I'm going to put in compassion here, of the unique and challenging situations that our students experience. If we can't see this in the midst of a global pandemic, I don't know when we can see it. They want respect, not in the sense that, uh, well, you're going to, you know, you're going to run this class. You know, I'm going to give you all of the control. No, but they want to be entered into a relationship where trust is at the core. Now, I threw these up. I'm not going to go over them, but I do want to mention one of these, which is really, really cool. Um, I'm going to turn on the, uh, the little pointer here. Do you see this one right here? Engaging, passion, and enthusiasm. Right here, the students equated a professor's passion with them making good pedagogical choices. Isn't that incredible? And this is the, my secret sauce for how I got to where I am today. It ain't through intellect. It's not through expertise. It's just because I, I'm passionate about what I'm trying to do. Students think I'm making good pedagogical choices, like I'm a good teacher. <laughs> That's incredible to me. So if we want to fix the bad professors we have at our institutions, we might want to talk to them about their level of passion. <laughs> because if I'm not motivated to talk about what we're talking about in the class, how can I expect my students to be motivated, right? And so I just thought that that was really, really interesting that they talked about this energy that shared with, with uh, them, them by their professors, okay? What about grades? Let's talk about grades, right? How can I motivate my students? Oh, I slap on some points to the assignment, to the reading. I put a deadline and then in my syllabus, I put a penalty, five points off if you don't submit this by Tuesday. Well. The studies show that grades actually thwart basic psychological needs. They thwart basic psychological needs for students. They kill academic motivation. What they found is narrative evaluations and actional feedback are actually better than grades at promoting trust, there's our word, not only between students and the instructor, but amongst students as collaborators. What do grades do? Grades rank and sort our students and they make them feel that the other person in the class is their competition. Because if there is a scarcity of A's, B's, C's, that person, my fellow peer, my fellow classmate is now a competition. And we wonder why our students won't collaborate. It could be because they're in competition. We set up a system that was a game and now they have to play the game by accumulating enough points to get the grade that they want so that they can move on and do whatever. And what we found is that grades are stressful, anxiety producing, and they're no way near accurate. If anyone can tell me the difference between an 83.4 and an 87.2, I'd love to hear it. And so what do we do in the in the absence of grades we use feedback and actually feedback in studies that i that i could share with you have been seen to be so much more effective when there isn't a grade if you place a grade on a student product and then give the feedback they're they're not looking at the feedback they're looking at the grade take away the grade your feedback has way more power to produce that deep learner that we want I love this quote about what this system of uh, the game of school has done to us. We are born with intrinsic motivation, a lot of self-respect, dignity, curiosity. Look at a preschool class. They're jumping off the walls. There's joy in that class. Go look at a 12th grade class or maybe a college freshman class. It's a different concept, right? It's a different environment. The forces of destruction begin early. The prize for the best Halloween costume, grades in school, gold stars, and up on through the university until they get to us. And so what we've done is we've 
what Ken Robinson said, we've educated the joy of learning out of our students. We've educated them out of it. They would have been self-curious. They would have been motivated. The problem was they went to school. And that's not a sad com commentary on our profession. I don't know what is, right? So we built this educational system where we say to the student, it's all about your GPA. It's all about your grades, right? And so what they've done is they've realized that that's what matters, not my learning, but my grades. And then we add on the injustice of grades, the oppression of grades, and now they basically are meaningless, right? And we call this ungrading. And that's one of my, um, my interests. And ungrading is the, the too long didn't read version of ungrading is this. It's basically a pedagogical mindset where we minimize the use of grades, percentages, points, and any attempt to measure or quantify the quality of students' cognitive production. Instead, we focus on the learning process where students can grow, take risks in their learning, not have a fear of failure. When we place these high stakes grades on our students' learning, they're not going to take the risks that produces deep learning. They're going to be those strategic learners and surface learners where they do what the professor wants to get by. Instead, ungrading says we're going to focus on the process over the product. Beautiful. So I just want to give a little pitch here. Um, if you want to look about, uh, if you want to learn more about ungrading, there's a, a book that um, that's just come out. It's called Ungrading. It's uh, an edited 13 chapter um, book written by 13 different um, uh, teachers and professors. I fac I'm facilitating right now an ungrading virtual book club on Twitter. I have the uh, website there if you want to go to ungrading.weebly.com. Right now we have 563 people in the book club. I've never had a book club virtual or physical that had this many uh, people in it. Now, uh, 563 people are in this. That kind of tells me there's a movement going on with ungrading. There are instructors that have seen the futility of trying to use grades to measure student learning. There's got to be an alternative, a better alternative, and it's ungrading. Um, so if you want to uh, look into that, please, uh, please do. I love this idea from uh, the, the, the student in one of my classes and this is what they wrote in a reflection. I love that the emphasis was placed on learning rather than grades. It causes you to think about the readings and writings rather than just doing them for the GPA. I think I'm gonna to try to use this philosophy in other classes. And the assumption in those other classes that those professors are using grades because this student has learned that grades will follow you if you focus on learning in the material. Now, of course, I've cherry picked this student reflection. I could give you some others that, that they, they talk about the uncomfortability of the grade being removed because they're so comfortable with it. They've been doing it for 12 years of their life. Um, but this student, I love this because we're talking about transfer of motivation. This student is gonna transfer their motivation from my class into their future classes. Love that, really do. So here's the snapshot of the professor actions that we can do. Promote learning goals leads to motivation. Demonstrate the relevance of what we're doing to students' lives, that's that why. Connect to students' personal interests. Show that this is where the content lives and breathes. So many of our courses deal with content that's dead, boring. It's not engaging at all. And finally, encourage student voice and choice dialogue and autonomy, that's the big deal there. When I enter into dialogue as a student, I feel empowered to take control over my learning. And so if we want to create these conditions, basically professors who actually supported autonomy had better classroom engagement and increased student motivation. That's what the research says, which is really, really interesting autonomy, the idea that I have self-efficacy, I can control the, the things that I'm doing. And we all know this, it works for us too. How many of you have gotten a directive from the administration at your institution? I don't deal well with directives. I deal better with invitations, right? And a directive, ha it will work. It ain't sustainable. You give too many people too many directives, they're not going to be engaged in their work. Instead, if we can flip that script to invite students into the process, the labor, 
that's where the learning is. That's where the motivation is. Finally, the content. And this is going to be the smallest part. I'm going to wrap things up with the content because I don't care about the content as much to tell you the truth. Okay. So the content is basically what we're doing. It could be the curriculum. It could be the activities, but it's basically what we are grappling over as critical thinkers in our courses. What we found is that when you make your content relevant and useful, guided by choice, and builds competency, that content is more directly related to student engagement. When the content fits into my personal perspective and experience, I'm going to be more apt to engage with it, be inspired by it, be motivated to work through it. Even if it's challenging, because remember what we said, if I have motivation and a sense of purpose, I have stamina to, and determination to deal with those new challenges. So we're not talking about, you know, uh, dumbing down anything. We're, we're still being cognitively challenging, but we're doing it in a different way. It's a different package. Um, research has shown that teachers can actually capitalize on this intrinsic motivation by making sure their content brings enjoyment or at least interest in the task. And so what do we do here? Most of the time when I create a, a course, right? I create the content before the students even show up. Maybe I should be making part of that content emerge during the 14 weeks with my students. Ask the students to bring the content that they find meaningful, beautiful, intriguing into the course so that they are content producers rather than content consumers. And so many of our students are consumers, passive consumers of content. Why not make them creative uh, creators of content? Ask them to create the content. Write the study guide for our exam or whatever you're doing. Uh, bring in outside articles that talk about the, 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 the concept that we're trying to, to show here in the class. Use mathematical concepts in a real world situation. So that is where we can transform the content to tap into that intrinsic motivation. One major thing that students have to have is mastery of the content. So students' mindsets as to the uh, probability of success will influence their excitement or frustrating, uh, frustration facing the task and thus their motivation. Meaning if I can't do it, I'm not gonna be engaged by it. So the trick for us is to find that optimal level of challenge that engages, but is also enjoyable and safe. I think if you're an education major, you might've heard this from Vygotsky, the zone of proximal development. It's that zone, that area where students uh, can do things independently, but they want to move towards doing things that they can't do yet. So they still need instructor guidance, peer collaboration. If we can get into that sweet spot, that zone, that optimum level of challenge, that's where the engagement, the challenges, but also the joy and the safety. I don't feel safe taking risks with this content if you're gonna bludgeon me with a grade, with points, with penalties. I've got to be able to fail. If I can't fail, I'm not gonna move forward. So how do we make our content authentic? Here's some things that we can do, right? To increase the student motivation. Emphasize the link between real life Design assignments that experiment with everyday materials, situations, personal anecdotes. Uh, part of my job as, this, uh, as a composition professor is to tell them what I've done in my life as a writer, how I've challenged with the blank screen, the uh, you know, writer's block. It's bringing myself into the class, not just depending on the content to do the teaching for us. We have to bring ourselves into this as it's a human process. So much of our policies and structures in our class are devoid of humanity in a way, right? We're just cogs in the machine spitting out grades so that the students can get average and then move on. And finally, we, we wanna have these choices that, that the students have over the content, okay? But it's really, really, really impactful when we can have them make connections to their personal goals, their personal lives. And I said this before, this is why I'm a little bit meta in my class, where I, one of my goals is to have them tell me their goals. <laughs> so one of my learning targets is to say, what are your learning targets in this class? What's your why? Let's see what we can do together 
in these 14 short weeks that we have with each other. Bain wraps everything up with this. And I'm going to end here. And it's basically this statement. To benefit from what the best teachers do, we must embrace a different model. One in which teaching occurs only when learning takes place. I love that. How many of us, I felt this so many times, where I'm teaching, 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 and no learning's happening. But I, what do I do? Teach, teach, teach. I keep teaching. So most fundamentally, teaching in this conception is creating those conditions. There's that Ken Robinson farming metaphor in which most, if not all, of our students will realize their potential to learn. And that Vygotsky zone of proximal development, there's also a theory of the zone of potential development. Love that. How many of the times that I taught my class where potential wasn't the focus? It was a deficiency model where I showed them their, their, their deficit model instead of saying, here's what your strengths are, try replicating those strengths the next time you do this. Beautiful. Positive attention is 30 times more, more powerful than negative feedback. So if we talk about that potential that you have as a student, that student's gonna be motivated to, to go. Finally, uh, the word motivation comes from the Latin mover, which is to move. And this is what we want our learning to be. Not stagnant, not rigorous and dead on the table, but moving, students moving in a process where they're not there yet. They're in the process of becoming, developing their critical consciousness about themselves and the world that they live in. If we can't be critically conscious right now with what's happening in the news, I, there's never been a time. We have to tap into that and engage our students so that they move through our course, but also through their lives with this idea of the potential that they have, the motivation and the stamina to keep becoming the learners that they are. If they can identify themselves as learners, we're halfway there. And that's all I have for today. Um, if you wanna reach out to me, if I missed something and you know something about motivation that I probably could have added in this, in this presentation, please email me. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well. Um, but I hope that today's discussion was beneficial for you. So I think Julie, if you want, we can open it up to questions. Absolutely. And David, um, thank you. Thank you. This is uh, me virtually applauding. I, I feel as if I've just drunk from a fire hose. And <laughs> so I've, I've, I'm overstimulated. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts and ideas. And um, uh, so let me first. Um, let me stop my sharing here. There we let go. me ask if anybody uh, besides me has some thoughts or questions that you would like to bring forward for the rest of our group. Well, let me start with one myself and uh, I will stop if someone else has an idea. Uh, you, you talked to David, you talked about um, the soul killing effect <laughs> of prizes for Halloween costume and prizes for this and prizes for that when people are toddlers. Um, you know, they start out more or less innocent and full of inspiration and so forth. And then um, the whole idea of competition creeps in. So I'm really intrigued by the notion that competition can be demotivating but I suppose that it can also be motivating uh, in certain instructional situations. And I wondered if you had any further thoughts about that. And also it, it sort of intersecting with this question was, I, I was pondering whether some of what you, um, you know, talked about and, and, and brought to our attention would vary between younger undergraduate students and older graduate students, because we assume graduate students to be self-motivating, but I think that is very often proven to be an incorrect assumption, so. Yeah, well, I'll, 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 that's a great question, Julie. I'll answer the first part of it with a, uh, an anecdote of my own. My son was in fourth grade at the time, I believe, and um, he came home depressed and uh, very upset. And I was talking to him and it had to do with his math class. 
and the teacher was dividing the class into squares and triangles. And what they were doing was basically the triangles were the smart kids in the math and the squares were, and they did it, you know, and I, 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 God bless the teachers, obviously, but they're trying to do it in a way that divided the class without them knowing. And guess what? You can't fool a fourth grader. They know what you're doing. And so he came home and said, I'm in the square group. I'm not smart. And I was like, what? And, you know, we, we had a big talk. And this is where I came to this idea that the joy of learning, trying, curiosity is killed by these types of schooling experiences. So this is what I said to my son and my daughter. We're not going to be bullied by grades. If you try your best, mom and dad will support you 100%. If you come home with a bad grade, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, can you explain what you were trying to do? If you can explain it, you're good. We're just gonna keep, keep going, figure it out. If you got that grade by not doing the work, you were lazy, you, you, you did, I'm coming after you. you. Mom and dad are gonna come after you, but we are not gonna be bullied by grades. This has been the magic sauce for my kids because now they are stress-free, they enjoy school to, you know, to a point, obviously, but that's what uh, I've, I've tried to do because that is, that's crazy, this competition. And we wonder why students have this self-identity based on their grades and GPA. Now we can do another, um, you know, presentation on ungrading. I, I, could, I could speak for another hour on this, but that's the short end of it. The other end of it is, yeah, make no assumptions about motivation and grade, and, and grade level or even age level. Uh, look at ourselves. When are we most motivated? Most likely when we're doing something that we're passionate about and we have deep meaning in. We're unmotivated when we're doing something because we have to or we've been directed to. And uh, I see this all the time in all the meetings. I, this is why I don't go to, I try not to go to meetings. They're decentivizing for me. It saps my energy. If I leave a meeting and I'm more tired than when I was when I walked into it, then we got to do better at our meetings. Uh, do, we've got to do better with the way we interact with each other. So I'm not assuming anything about a student's intellectual uh, capacity or level uh, as based on their motivation because we're all humans. And I think we think that students, and, and I get this, right? They're not doing the readings. They're not handing in their work. Well, that could be because we're going through a global pandemic. I mean, I mean, this idea that we compartmentalize our education from our real lives and experiences, it's bogus. So uh, when we fuse the, the two together, that's when I think we can have this complex discussion. And I know I didn't give you a, a straight answer, but there's because there is no straight answer. We are so complex in our humanity that it's hard for us to come to one you know, set ingredients that, that will work on every student. And this is the this is the toil, the labor of of teaching. It's not lecturing. It's not creating assignments. It's in the dialogic relationships we have with our students. That's that's where the teaching effort is. And when we have you know big classes of 30, 40 students, I get it. That's hard to do. And so, what about ourselves? Are putting out that respect, like that one study showed, that engagement, that passion. And, and, and there are ways that I can do that at scale. I don't have to do it in an individual group meeting or a individual meeting with everybody. I can do that at scale because guess what? Trust scales up. I love that. Trust scales up. You can trust and that thing, that blossoms out. Uh, threats, fear, grades, you know, uh, uh, averaging and, and that doesn't scale up. It doesn't. Are there any other questions? I didn't look at the chat if, if there were any. Wendy had a question about oh, group yeah. work. Sorry, uh, someone was trying to speak. Oh, that was actually were. me. Oh, you, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just going, when you were talking, um, it was a lot of it was about the, the professor and the student. And I wondered if you did group work in your classes at all. And if so, how that worked, because I know from my own experience and when I hear my kids complain about, you know, they get in a group and there's only one person that does all the work. How does that fit into your yeah. Um, motivation? Yeah. Um, oh, there's a great meme for group work uh, from one of the movies, but yeah, it's like, uh, uh, there's one person that does all the work. There's a slacker. <laughs> there's a guy that says I'm going to show up and never shows up. But, but um, yeah. yeah. So here's the problem with group work. I think if, if group work is graded and there's a percentage on it, 
uh, forget about it. You're not going to get authentic engagement with, with the students. When you remove the grade and you remove that, that threat, uh, collaboration is more natural. So what I do in my class is I use group work, group work collaboratively as one with helping with feedback, right? So I do feedback, students give feedback to each other, but before they give the feedback, I ask them to read our charter for compassion that we start the class with. And the charter for compassion sets the tone of the class, which is in anything we do together in this community of practice, we're gonna uh, uh, treat each other with compassion. That's the first thing. Then I give them what I would like the feedback to be if they, if they want, or just to give the feedback on their own. So I give them a choice. Do you want me to guide you? And I guide them through a tag method, a tag. Tell, ask, give. Tell something you liked about the work, ask the, your fellow student something that you would like to know more about, and then give feedback for forwards, it's a, that feed forward. Give them suggestions for what they could do the next time they blog or do whatever they want. So I give them some structure there, that's my collaboration. But I really get the most awesome feeling reading their work and what I put them in uh, is labor support groups. About five students are in a labor support group and every two weeks I give them little prompts to engage as a labor support uh, uh, group that, that helps each other. Believe it or not, the most beautiful writing happens in those groups. And I give them prompts like, uh, give me an internet meme that describes your, uh, your feelings right now in the semester. And they come in with their internet memes, it's awesome. I asked them just the other day, who inspires you in your labor? Can you, and the most beautiful, I've learned more about parents coming over from another country, working minimum wage jobs. And the person in my class wants to do well in the class because she does, want to make her father proud of her. And so at the graduation day, they want to be able to look at each other with pride. Um, you can't make that stuff up. And I get it. I'm in English. We are unicorns and rainbows. I get it. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I were in a very skill specific uh, course of content, you know, we're not going to be crying over our lab reports. I get that. But the idea is saying to them, these are your group members. Can you help each other, support each other as you go through the course? And so that's where I get a lot of that collaboration. Once you put the collaboration that has to produce a product that's going to be graded, eh, I hated doing that myself. I'm not going to, uh, you know, if I was the victim of oppression, I'm not going to victimize my students with that same oppression. So that's a, a, a part of my guiding principle is do no harm, right? Do no harm to the students. And uh, don't, don't assume that what happened to me should happen to them because you're in college now. So... I hope that answered that question. <laughs> yes, that that was excellent, and uh, I see that Sharon has a question that uh, is similar to one that I had myself, um, and uh, is is related to the ungrading movement. Oh, she says, "Does your university allow you to avoid assigning grades at the end of the semester?" Right. So let me. That's a great question. Let me clarify it. When I talk about ungrading, I am still contracted to give a final grade for that course. However, that will be the one and only grade my students receive. And guess what? They make the decision through a dialogic relationship with me about that grade. So when they, for me, they submit a self-assessment of mastery and they tell me what evidence they showed during the course that proves that they've met our learning targets. And then I ask them, what would you assign yourself the grade? Now, if you think about that, I still have the responsibility to enter those grades and they should be as accurate as I can get them. However, I asked my students to generate their own grade and guess what? I've never had to correct a student's grade. I always came to the same conclusion that they did. In fact, the most times I have to adjust the grade is I have to adjust it up. They downgrade themselves and this is the craziness of grades. They'll say, I, 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 the student would be doing A, the, the, all of the labor beautifully. And they'll say, well, I think I should have a B because I don't want to over promote myself. <laughs> and I go, oh my goodness, you're nuts. I said, no, you were doing, you were meeting mastery at an excellent level. So that, so the, most of the adjustments I have to go up. So yes, most of us on graders are not at institutions that have an N, uh, a P and an N, uh, pass, no pass. I would love if we did that. I would love it. But we try, and some institutions did go to pass, no pass during the pandemic, and then they reserted back to the ABC scale. 
Um, I would, would like to have done at our institution, but I think the institution's response was um, the, uh, we need that grades for transfer for our students to transfer to the four-year institution. So this is a systemic issue in education, but I will tell you this, I do have to give that grade, but that's it. I'm not playing that game in my class. In my class, we're gonna focus on feedback, positive attention, working and laboring through. And, I, and people say, well, well, where's the quality? If you can't give a grade to it, what kind? I wish I could show you my student reflections, their labor journal reflections throughout the year. They do about five of them. I do not have to prompt them at all. And they say, I am motivated to do quality work because I know my fellow students are gonna read my blog postings. I want them to, uh, how about revision? I will sit and I've spent eight hours on this blog because I wrote it and then I looked through it. I wanted to fix the mistakes. I didn't even have to do a peer review for editing or revision or anything like that. This all comes down to something that I fight with every day with myself, which is trust the student. Trust the student to know their cognitive potential. Trust the student to know their cognitive zone of you know, proximity, proximal development. Know where they are right now. If you trust the student, I'm telling you, you will most likely be never let down by it. I'm telling you, most of the students will not say, I'm in this class to play, I just need the points. In fact, they'll, they'll respond to it in a more positive way, which is, I feel free in this class. I feel free. David's not going to bludgeon me with a, a, an evaluative judgment. He's only going to look at my strengths. And in those strengths, when I ask questions, I can tweak and ask, next time you write your blog, could you do this? Can you maximize this? And, it's, and I know the strengths-based movement, but there's something to that. When I know my strengths are being recognized and valued, students will feel, I will feel heard. Uh, I will feel heard rather than just doing it for the points. Now, I had one honest reflection last semester. The student said, I really don't like doing this without grades because you're forcing me to produce quality work on every assignment. I just want to do the assignment <laughs> for the points. And I said, I love your honesty. With this, you proved my point. You're feeling compelled to produce your best quality work because I took away all of the, the you know, the, 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 the threats. You're doing it for yourself. But and, and, and they, they were very, very honest. They said, look, I just want to get the assignments done so I get the points. You're making me do quality work. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Oh, that's price. David, we have two. Um other topics in chat. I don't know if you can see chat. Okay. Um, Sharon had a follow-up question about um, literature to support the dislike for group assignments. And I would suggest, Sharon, that you might want to email David separately to talk some more about that because he may have some good um, yeah. citations for yeah. you. I, I, like I said, most of this is my personal anecdotes, Julie, my personal experiences. But yeah, sure, I can... I can um, uh, enter into some some discussion with that. That's great. And then Denise has asked, and we have like one minute left okay. <laughs> <laughs> for you to answer. Okay. How how are learning targets different than course objectives? Yeah, good one. So I do the course objectives in my syllabus that's in Canvas. I have I'm contracted to do that. We have to do that. So what I do is I have another art document that kind of translates the course objectives into language that the students can use and I call them my learning targets because here's the reason Denise we write our course objectives not for our students we do it for middle states and any other accrediting body that's why we write our course objectives the students and ask your students so you even looking at those course objectives at week four or five they ain't so what I do is I've translated my 10 objectives for the course into four learning targets and we shoot for those learning targets. Now, what I tried to do is do it with the students. I would love to do this, and I still wanna do this, which is come to some group production of what our learning targets will be in this course with the course objectives in mind. So yeah, the objectives, and, I, and I'm sure there's more expertise about objectives, learning targets, learning goals. I, all I say is this, directives don't work, invitations are better. So in my four learning targets that I've translated from my, the course objectives, I say, here are, in, here are the four invitations to you to shoot for these targets in the class. Let's see if you can write and do your blogs based on these targets. And the targets are developing a writing practice, developing a voice, you know, all the good stuff that we do in our, in our courses. Thank you, David. Um, yes. I, I feel that you've earned a second and perhaps third round of response because um, I'm sensing a lot of engagement. And and I would also like to um, to uh, uh, 
call for a round of applause, uh, of applause for everyone who signed up for this webinar because it means that you care about whether your students are motivated or not. So uh, very, uh, let's take a moment for self-congratulation about that. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Um, giving us a lot to think about and we will see you hopefully at a future webinar from Maryland Online. Thank you again, David. Thank you, okay, bye-bye.